I think the thing I like about it is that it has this potential to reach a lot of different audiences, and that's something that <clears throat> continues to drive my work. I'm very interested in um, public-facing texts and, and things that are, you know, not just kind of hold away in little uh, silos for other academics to cite. And, you know, um, so I think... Um, yeah, I, I like that it has those multiple layers. Um, and then my dad's relationship. So <laughs> so my dad, like pulling my dad into this was in many ways a very practical thing because I, I, um, I had this oral history interview um, that I had access to, but all of the family photos and all of these things were back in Seattle and I didn't get the, I didn't know I was doing this project until I had moved. And, and so I was, um, you know, I was very lucky to have my dad's help in in helping to scan all of the photographs and and um, you know uh, sort through the the materials um, that were there and and send the digital um, the digitized uh, videos of the eight millimeter film from our <clears throat> you know because nobody had ever done this kind of thing before there was no archivist right we just have we're just you know it's a bunch of boxes of of things or, you know, bookshelves with old albums on them. And so um, I was really lucky to have my dad help me with that. And and it's funny because I've, I've kind of continued um, drawing him in as a collaborator in other things, mostly things related to um, I'm, I'm working on another project that's kind of come out of the Olive Project and, and involved bringing my dad along with me on this kind of pilgrimage to uh, northern Minnesota in January <laughs> to drive around on these, you know, like icy dirt roads to find the farm that my grandma grew up on. And my dad just comes along and he's like helping, you know, he's taking photographs and like um, being the chauffeur and like, you know, telling me family stories that kind of are the backdrop to these things. And and so it's been a really nice um, thing for me to have uh, you know, this excuse to, to collaborate with my dad and to have like a different kind of relationship with him that we never had, you know, when I was growing up. So, I mean, I, we had a good relationship, but having a different kind of working relationship. And now he's just retired and, and he's uh, started making videos and things. So it's really cool to kind of, to see how that's uh, kind of rippled out. Awesome. And I'm going to pause just for a second and lift my computer because of the fan. I'm just going to, like, let oh, it sure. off. <laughs> um, but so far, it's, I don't know, I, I hope things are good on your end. My, my end has actually been remarkable in terms of usually it heats up a lot faster than this. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, so the one nice thing about this call recorder that I have installed is that it will, it puts your voice and mine on two separate um tracks and so unless your fan is coming through really loudly um through my computer speakers i don't think it's going to be a huge problem so oh, awesome that's awesome yeah so i don't know if you can hear it on your end possibly vaguely now that you mention it but you know. okay so <laughs> at any point feel free like to stop if suddenly it sounds really loud okay <laughs> i'll pause things for a moment um but what you were just describing might actually be a really good segue to, I feel like this is one of the harder questions, um, but I, I would really love to, love to know too, like just in terms of the particular moment in which you composed and published your web text, um, both like, what did you think was particularly innovative about it? Or maybe another way of putting it is, what did it, do you think it contributed um, to scholarship across the many areas that, that you're covering within the web text. I mean, oral histories, but also these questions about design and co-construction, um, audience. But um, also, um, what was maybe particular about that moment too? So I guess it's a question of what do you think that your web text contributed, but maybe also um, what was happening at that moment in time? Like what did you observe of, of other texts um, in, your, in your area? So this is a hard question. <laughs> well, I think um, <clears throat> one thing that I think that possibly, I mean, it's hard for me, honestly, to say, you know, like um, what makes it innovative, right? Like I didn't even know, I didn't have a foundation on which to understand what I was, you know, my, my relationship to the field at that time was so new that I didn't even really 
know what I was responding back to, to be honest. I knew um, the conversations in oral history a lot better than I knew the conversations in composition and so in, in rhetoric. So um, I think it, one of the things that it did was bring those two fields into conversation in an interesting way. Um, I know oral history, uh, you know, people have written about oral history, using oral history in the classroom, um, but in more of a way where, where people, you know, students would go out and conduct interviews and then transcribe them and then write essays um, based on them and, and kind of something more or less um, along the lines of what what traditional oral historians would do as well. Um, and um, I, so I think it was a moment, like the, the moment in, I guess, uh, the humanities more broadly um, w with this turn toward um, thinking about digital media and thinking about different forms for producing scholarship and for producing um, texts that kind of blurred the boundaries between scholarship and, and popular kinds of texts. Um, I think that one of the things that it drew upon was that moment that seemed to be of interest both in oral history and in uh, composition and rhetoric at the time um, and found a place where they could meet in the middle. And so um, I think I, so I, I actually, strangely enough, I've been to a number of oral history association conferences, but I never, I think I missed going the year that I produced this, where this would have been new and I would have thought to present it. So I've actually never presented this project at an oral history conference. Um, uh, but I, I'm, you know, I'm continuing to be involved in, in the field. Uh, and the, I guess, I don't know, it's kind of a interdisciplinary subfield kind of thing or a method, I don't know. But um, there's a community of people working in oral history who um, are really at this moment kind of getting interested in, um, you know, different ways of repurposing and using oral history um, recordings and materials to, to create different kinds of texts in a way that um, I think is piggybacking on a lot of the stuff that's been happening in rhetoric and composition. And so uh, it was, I think, a fruitful moment to start that conversation. And um, I, I don't know how much it has, you know, rippled out to um, get more people involved with oral history within composition and vice versa. But I think, um, you know, I have... Um, a graduate student that I'm working with right now who's who's very interested in oral history and I would like to think that there's some way in which you know like the, these kinds of conversations are starting to get opened up more um, through um, projects like this that uh, that ask for that um, conversation and and I guess for me coming to um, composition and rhetoric I, I came from a very interdisciplinary background. I never had, I didn't ever study English. I was, you know, I came from all of my degrees start with C. This is <laughs> how I make meaning of my, um, my academic trajectory. So, um, I think, uh, there's, you know, a way in which composition and rhetoric, um, opens up possibilities for a lot of conversations with other disciplines. And I think that um, media and digital text um, and um, thinking about production um, and um, making text as a form of thinking is a real opportunity to um, cross those boundaries. So maybe I could ask a question to go back to something earlier about the horizontal scrolling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, because I think, I mean, it's something that seems so integral to your text and it, it totally changes a person's engagement with it because you can click um, on a photograph or on one of the like keyword beneath the photograph and it brings you to a different section. So it's not even that you necessarily have control over the scroll bar, but you have it's almost like a choose your own adventure yeah. kind of story <laughs> as you're navigating these particular narratives. And so, um, you know, it, it I'm wondering, I don't even know what my question is as much as, like, <laughs> I'd love to hear more about it, but also out of maybe um, curiosity, if, um, as you were thinking about horizontal scrolling, if there were particular pieces you had seen online, because you had described earlier that, like, you were finding all of these help sources that said, like, no, don't do, don't do that, thing, but yet you really wanted to do that, and feels like that's like one of the most innovative like strengths of the piece just in terms of not only design but the narrative art works plural. Um, yeah you know I honestly at thinking back I can't recall a specific 
text or, or website that I had looked at and thought, oh, horizontal scrolling. I think it was more that I knew it was not the way that people were used to interacting with the web, that the vertical scroll at that time especially was kind of predominant. And, um, and I wanted to, I wanted to force a kind of different interaction, I guess, with the interface. And, and I also, I mean, this is interesting because I don't, I don't even know why I made some of the decisions that I made. You know, it was, it was like, I remember drawing it out on a piece of paper and kind of thinking, you know, here's how it might look and here, you know, maybe what if you could make the scroll bar go away? I didn't even know if I could do that, you know, at the time. Um, <clears throat> and so it was very much like one thing led to the next thing. And, and I'm not sure I had some grand vision from the beginning because it was very much kind of an experiment in um, kind of creating the method as I was going based on what I, the basic skills that I had and the things that I could figure out and all of that. Um, I think, so I've, I can't remember now, there's a, there's one article in um, the new work of composition that the, um, the Computers and Composition Digital Press ebook, um, I think Diana George and uh, Tim Lockridge and someone else whose name I, is escaping me right now, but they, they wrote an article um, thinking about linearity and um, that, that nonlinear um, text isn't, it's not really an issue of nonlinear, um, that, that isn't something that we should be so concerned with. And, and talking about the way that the Olive Project draws on these um, <clears throat> tropes of, or, or conventions of um, comics and of the film strip sort of moving back and forth across the screen. And I had never, I mean, I'm sure that that informed my thinking in a in a way that we're all humans who have all of these you know experiences with different kinds of media and and there was something that prompted me to do that but I had never honestly until reading that I had never thought about that before I was like that's so interesting and I think like you know in a lot of ways the fact that it kind of goes back and forth across the screen um in that way almost makes it seem more linear <laughs> than than like moving up and down so I think that the the main um kind of innovation is that there are it's not honestly it's it's a it, it's putting two things together that aren't usually put together and so on one hand it's kind of a pretty standard like hypertext interaction right you click on you can choose different links and and based on which link you choose you go to a different part in the story right if it were if it didn't have that horizontal orientation it would feel much more familiar i think and then um I think the animation of um, being able to see, that was something that was really important to the project, being able to see everything um, that's happening in between flashing across as you scroll so that you're getting a sense of like all the things you're missing and all the things you're moving past and, and this kind of, um, yeah, the experience of the incomplete nature of what you're experiencing through the the little nodes that are that you're actually able to access was really important to it. So kind of putting those three things together, you know, hypertext, the horizontal scroll and that animation, um, and and uh, of course taking out the scroll bar to add the constraint to it, I guess was the the formula that I came up with. That, um, but it's in I mean, I was drawing on conventions from a number of familiar kinds of text and putting them together in a new way, I think.